Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Justin Peter, and I am director of Quest Nature Tours. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar that we're hosting for Ontario Nature. And uh, today's webinar is, in fact, uh, the first of a series of three webinars that we'll be hosting uh, over the coming weeks. We're really uh, excited to be a part of this, uh, a part of the series for Ontario Nature. And uh, today's webinar promises to be a really interesting one, as uh, we'll be welcoming James Campstra, who's going to be speaking about the Gananoque Lake Nature Reserve. And uh, we're particularly excited that uh, Ontario Nature is kicking off this series with this reserve. Uh, this year, in fact, marks our uh, Quest Nature Tours' um, 50th anniversary. And uh, on that event, we decided to become involved uh, with uh, Ontario Nature in order to secure this reserve. So it's really special. I know that uh, many of you, uh, certainly I have not visited the reserve at all and partly because of the the nature of this interesting year um, uh, this will make for a for a chance for all of us to to get to know the reserve better um, our speaker of course is james Campstra, and james you're there right yes yes i was here where do i well while, while you find that i'd like to um oh there's james great and uh I, and I do want to just send out a special shout out to all of the members of the different um, nature clubs in Ontario that uh, contributed to the funding of this reserve. Uh, special shout outs to um, our Quest Nature Tours um, community, as well as I, I know some there are some members of the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club who are attending today's webinar. So, um, and they also, also contributed to this effort. So. Um, James, uh, James, we of course are a speaker, and I think many of you may know James. James has been um, a part of the Ontario uh, naturalist community for many years, I believe. In fact, he uh, has been a member of Ontario Nature and its, well, it's, as its predecessor, the Federation of Ontario Naturalists for 50 years, uh, currently serving on the board of the directors. And uh, I know James, uh, I'm sure if uh, we started chatting about any little, any particular aspect of nature, butterflies, birds, uh, trees, whatever it might be, that we could uh, have a really good, inter interesting conversation because you're really uh, accomplished in all of those different areas. And I think that makes you um, the, the perfect host to be uh, taking us on this virtual tour of uh, the Gananoque Lake Nature Reserve to show us all the many different things that make this interesting. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, James. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Justin, for that introduction. And there I am. There I am. So hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out today. And it's my pleasure to show you about this new nature reserve, Gananoque Lake. Now, now just uh, a housekeeping thing here. Do I do I need to do anything else here, Justin? You just need to click on the slide to advance it. Okay. 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 And then hit the key to advance it, the forward key. Okay. Gananoque Nature Reserve. This was quite a, a unique opportunity that came up last year when uh, First of all, Ontario Nature has a nearby nature reserve called Lost Bay, which is one of their real most diverse reserves that they have. So this new property just came up for sale last year within three or four kilometers of that other reserve. And so nature, uh, Ontario Nature broadcasted to its membership and secured enough funding to purchase this new property. And so I had the good fortune of getting out there a few times before many of the other members or people in the public have. And that is what I'm going to tell you about today. First of all, its location. Probably most of you have heard of Gananoque. You know, it's a town along the St. Lawrence River in the Thousand Islands. And Gananoque Lake is just a little bit north of there, about 15 kilometers further north 
along the Gananoque River. So this, this shot that you see right here, the nature reserve is on the southeastern part of the, of the lake, right in here. It's really, really the river, the whole system. Gananoque Lake even is part of this river that starts well north of here and flows south into uh, the St. Lawrence River. And it is this, this beautiful setting. In fact, one of the real special things is its location. It's within the, what's called the Frontenac Arch or the Frontenac Axis, which as you may know, it's on the Canadian Shield, but it really is a very special different part of, of the shield that many of you might be familiar with if you say in Georgian Bay or Algonquin or Muskoka. But the shield comes to a, a narrow neck where it, where it um, crosses the St. Lawrence River and joins up with the Adirondacks Mountains in New York State, and that's where the Canadian Shield ends. But even the Thousand Islands are, are here because that's those the Canadian Shield rock. And so the area is quite different to the east and the, and the west, where these are more uh, Ordovician limestone areas. And, um, and so that location is, is pretty important. It really is a diverse part of the province because of its southern location, its nearness to the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario. And so we do have this, this, this setting is really important. Recently, there is a, a Frontenac Arch Biosphere Reserve is, has been set up. Now, a Biosphere Reserve is recognized by the United Nations. It's not like a national park or, or a real protected area, but it does encourage a lot of protection, includes communities. And so here you can see the boundaries of this Frontenac Arch Biosphere Reserve and Gananoque Lake is part of that reserve. Now this shot shows you in kind of a broader scale, a aerial photo of the context. So Gananoque Lake is here, the nature reserve is right here, and this is all part of that Frontenac axis. So the narrow part of the Canadian Shield. And one of the really interesting things about it is, is it's, it's close to, the farmlands of the south and in fact it's kind of intermixed you can see pockets of pretty intense agriculture in areas but then you see these really green blobs and lakes and so this is all the the rugged canadian shield rock and because of its proximity to like the saint lawrence here there's a lot of southern type species so it's it really is a very unique area now many years ago i worked as a park naturalist at St. Lawrence Islands National Park. And so I had the opportunity to spend some time and really, I really developed this love for this whole Frontenac axis. It really is one of my favorite parts of the province. And so it is such a, such a great uh, feat that this nature reserve has been set up here. And so it is a, right on the lake part of it is on the shoreline of the lake. And so you have this Canadian shield um, landscape. This is a closer view of the reserve itself. And I'll just point out the main features of the reserve. The, uh, the, the access road, just to the north, there is a road called Sandy Bay Road, which goes to a few cottages on the lake. And um, the only way really into the reserve, there's a little cottage road that snakes in through here. And it's so covered under the trees, you can't even see where that road is. You can see that the northern almost half of the reserve is this pretty heavily forested area, deciduous forest. There's also this interesting wetland right here. It's about six hectares. It's isolated from the lake or from uh, the other wetland. And the southern part, almost 60% of it, my math might be sound a little wrong because I said 50 and actually about 40 for the woods. The southern part is this extensive marsh. It's right along the Gananoque River. There's also this, this smaller creek that comes out called Wilsey Creek. And so here you have the setting of the Gananoque Lake, 147 hectares of beautiful land that's in, in prime shape. The cottage road that goes in, it is a private road. So there's no real good access for the public into the reserve at the moment. This, this road goes into a few private cottages in fact, the first time when I went out to the reserve in the in the spring, I wasn't even sure where the boundary of the road was or what the boundary of the reserve. So I followed this road in 
and I was well within the reserve and I thought, when am I going to hit the reserve? And I pulled out my GPS and I realized I was already in the middle of the reserve. This is a, a, one of the two cottages at the end of the road. So they, the, the owners of those cottages have maintained that road for the, for the last number of years, but now it is within the reserve itself. It's really quite a beautiful forest in there. It's mostly deciduous. There's, a, there's really not too much coniferous. It's uh, mid-age. At one time, much of the forest was, was logged over and some of it was farmed or pastured. But we do have some spectacular big trees in there. This is a white oak. There's a, some really large red oaks in there as well. Uh, a really a beautiful mature uh, deciduous forest. There's a couple of pockets of open field. Now they're really, when you saw that air photo, you go, well, it doesn't look like they're much field, but there's just a couple of small pockets and they're slowly growing in. And so we have different plants that occur in those field areas. So they are quite special within the context of that forest. The Northern Marsh is, is quite interesting. Quite a large part of it is dominated by swamp loosestrife. And that's a pretty rare feature to have a marsh dominated by swamp blue stripe. Not all of it though, part of it is more of an open water sedge bulrush marsh, great spot for amphibians and some water birds. So that's that isolated six hectare marsh. Then we get to the southern part of the reserve on the edge of the forest, you get this transition zone of thicket swamp on the border of that extensive marsh to the south. Most of that marsh on the south is cattail marsh. The western fringe where it's right along the Gananoque River is really interesting. You've got different types of vegetation there. There's pickerel weed marsh, there's water lilies, a lot of uh, submerged aquatics. There's also a fairly extensive area of wild rice. And then it's possible to go up the creek, the Wiltsey Creek. So this is right along the Wiltsey Creek where you can see it's pretty solid cattail marsh. And uh, really the bulk of that Southern marsh is, is an extensive it is on the Canadian Shield, but there aren't a lot of uh, outcrops. There are some outcrops in the forested area, but we don't get some of those rock barren areas that you do see in the area. There are a couple spots right along the shoreline of Gananoque Lake where you can see the rock sticking out like you like right here. But the, 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 the terrain is quite undulating. The soil is fairly shallow with the rocks under the canopy occasionally appearing. Now, Ontario Nature had big plans to hold a bio blitz this year on the 20th of June. And I don't know how many of you have been on a bio blitz, but they're a lot of fun. Typically, they're a, a 24 hour period where as many experts and wannabe experts get out in the field, try to document all the plants and animals and organisms, whatever they can. Of course, COVID hit and the whole thing had to be canceled. But I thought, hey, I'm gonna get out there, why not? So I went out, I called my friend Chris Grooms, who's uh, quite a key naturalist in Kingston, and we, we spent a great day out there trying to document everything we possibly could. And so there's, um, originally I was going to focus on plants and insects, but then when the whole BioBlitz got canceled, I decided to do everything. So the 20th of June was prime breeding bird season. So we started with documenting all the birds that we could with that lovely deciduous forest. It really is good for forest birds. Scarlet tanager, for example, is a area sensitive bird that really needs quite extensive areas of deciduous forest. We had many of those singing in the forest. A lot of other forest birds like uh, ruffed grouse and uh, various species of warblers and vireos, yellow-throated vireo, which is not too common. It's quite, we had several in there. That forest really dominates that northern part of the reserve. So you have a pretty close canopy. And one of the bird species that really likes that kind of habitat is, is the, um, the cerulean warbler. Now the forest is also quite interesting in that it it um, has quite a few southern southern um, components to it. For example, here is a slippery elm, which despite its name, the leaves are very rough, almost like sandpaper. 
and there's other southern species like shagbark hickory there's um, bladder knots white oaks so it really has a very southern character so we find such species um, and butternut too butternut is is a endangered species which there's a, quite a number of individuals on the park in the reserve now this one as you can see doesn't look very healthy and if you know much about butternut it's a, a species that's really on the way out a couple of the individuals there are still in moderate good shape but most of them look like this so they've been hit by the butternut canker and um, another 10-15 years we could lose the butternut altogether but anyway we still have some of them for the time being the cerulean warbler that was the one species i was hoping to find there because i knew that that general area is where where the ceruleans are and i was not disappointed we found four singing male birds on the day that we were there on the 20th and we only covered part of the park so it looks like there really is a good population of cerulean warblers i'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this species it's generally a carolinian species it has really declined in ontario it was was uh, originally special concern and just a few years ago it was reassessed and as endangered because most of the populations in ontario have fizzled out uh, very few left in the Carolinian area, but the Frontenac axis area is really the stronghold for the Cerulean Warbler. So it really is great that we have such a robust population. And uh, I guess in future years, when we can do more intensive surveys, it'll be interesting to know how many pairs we actually have on the property, but four on the day we were out. Incidentally, that last picture and this one, I cannot take credit for. Virtually, virtually all the other photos in this are mine, but I did not take that cerulean warbler and I unfortunately didn't take this beautiful shot of a golden wing warbler. We also had a couple of golden wing warblers. It is uh, nationally threatened, provincially special concern, a species that's really been declining due to habitat loss as well as hybridization with blue wing warblers. But so uh, a couple of those ones singing away on territory. And, uh, and so we do have a couple of really interesting birds on site, ones that are, are quite special. I also focused a lot on plants and through the, the, the few times that I was out there, I documented about 250 species of vascular plants. So that's, that's uh, pretty good, pretty good. We, uh, the one on the left here is called the Parlin's Pussy, Parlin's um, Pussy Toes. And then the one on the right is the Canada sanical and uh, the sanical particularly is not a very common plant. One of the plants that really uh, was surprise, a surprising find is this one. It's called the Aero Arum. It is a provincially rare plant and I, I knew there was a record of the Aero Arum further down on the Gananoque River but uh, I had sort of forgotten about that and when I, when I went um, marching through the thicket swamp area i saw this plant and i first thought see it looks like an arrowhead an arrowhead has a similar shaped leaf but then it struck me about just something doesn't look quite right it looks so glossy in fact it reminded me of a house plant the philodendron and with good reason because it's in the same family as the as the philodendron it's called the arrow arum it has these glossy leaves quite a robust plant it's in the same family as Jack in the pulpit and skunk cabbage. So the flower is very different. It, it has a spade and a spadix. This is the flower of the plant. It's got a long tube in there similar to a jack in the pulpit. And we found literally hundreds of plants in that area in the thicket swamp, but it was quite restricted. They were not elsewhere on the lake because so later on in the summer, I canoed around quite a bit of Gananoque Lake. I did not find arrow arums anywhere else along the shoreline of Gananoque Lake. So it really seems to be a very strong population within that thicket marsh, thicket swamp area of the, the reserve. Some other really interesting and distinctive plants, uh, purple gerardia along the shoreline, uh, Lozell's twayblade. blade, it was in the thicket swamp as well. It was the only orchid I found other than the um, Helleberine, which is a non-native orchid. 
other features, there's uh, occasional pockets of, of um, vernal pools, of course, small swamps within the, the larger forest. These are really important breeding areas for amphibians, such as spotted salamanders and spring peepers. This whole area of the Frontenac axis is well known for its reptiles. It's uh, apart from Southern Georgian Bay, it is one of the best places in Ontario supporting a wide range of species. If, if looking at the atlas by Ontario Nature, there's about 30 species in this square and the adjacent square. Now they haven't all been found on the reserve yet, but there is certainly more species to be found. This one is a northern water snake that we encountered along the edge of the marsh on a, where a rock came out and it was a pretty, pretty bold fellow. We got quite close to him. Unfortunately, one of the, the best ways of finding, documenting reptiles is finding road kills. So we found this milk snake on the San, Sandy Bay Road just north of the reserve. And, uh, a, and another one that was found there was, was a black rat snake or gray rat snake as they're now called. Now I didn't find that one, but this is a prime area for rat snakes. We know that the Lost Bay Nature Reserve just a little bit to the north have been found uh, a number of times there. And throughout this whole Frontenac axis area is really the stronghold for the rat snakes in Ontario. They virtually disappeared from uh, the Carolinian part of the province where they were once fairly common. And we haven't actually found them in the main part of the reserve yet, but they're almost certainly there since they are throughout the area and the habitat is suitable. This shrubby plant that we found in the field area is an interesting plant. It's called a prickly ash. It's kind of nasty to go through because it's got thorns all over it and forms these dense thickets. And it's a southern type species in the citrus family. So it's in the same family as oranges. And another interesting thing about it is it's the food plant for the giant swallowtail butterfly. On the left, you can see the caterpillar. It looks like a bird dropping. It's a pretty sluggish thing, but it feeds heavily on those prickly ash. And the butterfly, it's the largest butterfly we have in Canada. 30 years ago, they were virtually not present in, in the Frontenac axis or in Eastern Ontario. And since then, they have expanded into the area amazingly and now are relatively common in areas. I did see them in the reserve and they're double brooded. So they come out in June and the second brood comes out in August, but a truly spectacular large butterfly. And so certainly one to look for if you ever get out to the reserve. Another interesting butterfly found on the reserve is called Appalachian Brown. It likes swamps. Again, it's a Southern butterfly. It's, we have a more common similar species called, a, called the um, Eyed Brown. But it, uh, and the differences between the two are very subtle. But so interesting, we had the Appalachian Brown on the site. Now, most of the reserve being heavily forest doesn't support a lot of butterflies, but there's more species will be found in the in the wetland areas, especially where we have some sedge marshes. But since there was only a limited amount of, of field or edge habitat, the number of butterflies is not uh, huge. Getting out to the marsh. That was a very interesting area to see. I didn't get there in the earlier visit, but when I was out in August, we canoed around the, the fringes of the marsh to get a good sense of what was there. And here you see a lot of the, it looks like algae, that light green, but it's not algae. I'll show you in a second what it is. There are some really interesting plants out there. There's things in Eastern Ontario that we don't get in the central and Western part, like this, for example, is called the grass leaved arrowhead. So it is a type of arrowhead, relatively common in this area, but we don't get it in, in the GTA, for example. Now, this is what looked like algae. And when I, when I looked really close at it, I found out it is not algae at all. It's the smallest flowering plant. It looks like, you may know duckweed is a very small plant that floats on the water. Well, this is even way smaller than, than duckweed. All those little specks of green that you see there about one millimeter in size it's called water meal and green masses there's lots it was just covering whole areas 
of the water on the fringes of the marsh. So quite interesting to see. And, then, and looking in the, at the aquatic plants, it really is diverse. There's various species of pond weeds. There, this interesting plant is called a false mermaid. It has these uh, serrated leaves. There was also the X floating water marigold, a couple of species of water lilies. So a very diverse aquatic plant flora as well. I didn't get out in the marsh in the breeding bird season, but the fringe area looks really, really suitable for some of the, the marsh birds. It looks very suitable for least bitterns, for example. We did see great blue herons there and wood ducks, hooded mergansers. It'll be interesting to get out in another year during the breeding season, but getting into that marsh in the south, you really have to get out in a canoe or a kayak. Most of that marsh is dominated by cattails. And uh, however, going along Wilsey Creek, we found one robust patch of Phragmites, the common reed. And as you probably all know, it's a very nasty invasive plant that is really threatening a lot of our wetlands in Southern Ontario. So we have this patch and we may, uh, Ontario Nature may need to look at it to see if it can be contained before it spreads, because who knows, down in the future, it could completely cover the marsh. We've seen that happen in other areas. But by and large now, so far, invasives have not been uh, too, too much of an issue in the nature reserve. In the lake, I did see a lot of these things. It's a snail, it's called a striped mystery snail, and it is not native either. A lot of it in the water doesn't seem to be causing particular problems at the present but it is not a native species. So not everything is native here as we know elsewhere in Ontario. But most of what we have on the site is native. Looking at some of the other insects, certainly didn't do a complete inventory, but found a few really interesting species. The one on the left is a, is a huge type of ichneumon wasp that, that um, parasitizes wood-boring beetles. So it has these really long ovipositors that it's sticks in the wood like you'd see what it's doing here and it finds these larvae and lays its eggs inside of the larva which then parasitize it. On the right is a type of mud dauber wasp but this one was quite interesting. I've never seen one like this with a big white spot on the thorax and on the antenna. I haven't been able to identify that one yet but very interesting and no doubt there are so many more insects to be found with the diversity of trees what we really would be a great thing to do in the coming year is to get out with a, a crew of moth, set up some moth lights and see what kind of species are there. And there's certainly more vascular plants to be found, especially when we get into some of the more obscure species like um, sedges. Like I said, there's 250 species that we know of so far. And getting into some of the other groups, we know there's so many more like the, the fungi, I know the one on the left is called chicken of the woods, but we certainly haven't done much of a survey of fungi, but with a forest like this, there's uh, no doubt hundreds of species present there. There's also other, other organisms like um, liverworts that we see on the right and lichens. We'll need to get experts out there in the, in the coming year or so to find out more about what, what is on this diverse property. But the good thing is that we have protected a really nice piece of the Frontenac axis. It fits in so well with the other reserve that Ontario Nature has, the Lost Bay. And between the two of them, they're, they're protecting a good representation. And they're part of this whole network of uh, protected areas within the Frontenac axis. The shoreline of, of Gananoque Lake, well, much of, um, we don't have a long stretch of shoreline there, but there's uh, a couple hundred meters, which which uh, will prevent cottage development in that area. And then the forest with its mature trees, it will continue to mature and uh, provide habitat for a whole range of species, particularly some of the species at risk like the cerulean warbler and the other plants, the arrow arum, and no doubt we have, there's, there's other species to be And it, it, it will be a great place to experience. Personally, or uh, 
currently there is is no real good access to the site we don't have any trails in there there's only that private cottage road but if if uh you get out in the canoe or a kayak it's possible to get out into the, the Catrail marsh or the, the shoreline along the gananoque river so a lot of beautiful habitat to be seen there i just like this to um give a special thanks to all those people who protected this area and so if it was if ontario nature didn't jump on board when it did protecting this area probably wouldn't have been possible because uh someone else might have bought the land and they might have had different ideas in particular quest nature tours has made a made a significant contribution environment and climate change canada the Ottawa Field Naturalists, the Echo Foundation, and many Ontario Nature members. When Ontario Nature put out its appeal, they were very happy to see the response and that this, this reserve was able to be uh, purchased and protected. So thank you. That is uh, a little insight into this new reserve that Ontario Nature now has protected, the 26th reserve. And I will turn it over back to Justin. Well, great. Thank you very much, James, for that uh, that nice um, taster. I'll call it a taster because there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, really appealing things I think uh, to consider there. And I, I don't know if, if we'll all get a chance to get there eventually, but it was certainly nice to get that that sense of that what makes that site unique. And um, I think there's a lot to look forward to as well as we find out more, I'm sure. Now, James, we have a, a of course, always a very interested audience. And so there's a number of questions here. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see them as well as I can, but I thought I would ask you, um, let me just look through the questions here. Well, I have one question here. I don't know if you can answer this, but where can one put in a kayak? Uh, that's a good question. Um... I'm just not sure where the nearest bridge is. There's there's cottages along the lake. The, there's a the road that is on the north side goes to a couple of cottages. It's called Sandy Bay Road, and it's just a couple of hundred meters north of where the reserve starts. But there's no real. It's, the road ends at a at a couple of cottages. It's not really a public access point. There's um there is a conservation area to the south of it, and it's called um oh what's it called? It's called uh, Marble Rock, and there is a bridge that crosses there, and so that would be a place to put in, and it would be a several kilometer paddle upstream from there. That's the only thing I know that uh, I can think of. I'm not sure what the access is like in, at Lost Bay. Lost Bay is north of north of this one. It would be a pretty good paddle from there because you have to go around a big bulge in the north end so it'd probably be a six or seven kilometer paddle at least from there what's the current like by the way pardon me what's the current like in the gananoque oh, river? yeah the current it's it's a pretty slow moving river so certainly um right along the, the edge of the reserve there's not much of a perceptible current in the, in that section further downstream it's a pretty slow moving river most of the way to Gananoque. I think there's a few areas where you get some currents, but it's mostly a slow moving river. And um, maybe a sort of related question. I have a question here from Kathy. Kathy's asking, how deep is the lake? How deep is the lake? It, it's a fairly deep lake. It's not a, it's, I, I don't know in terms of meters, but um, well, the, just off the marsh, you'd have a couple it would probably be a couple of meters the river there would be maybe two or three meters the lake itself goes uh, much deeper than that so it is a relatively deep lake i think uh my colleague here samantha in the background she's saying it google says 20 how much 24 meters if that 24 helps. meters 24 okay. meters i guess that's the middle part of the lake the farthest from the shore basically. yeah so i mean that's not an excessively deep lake but i I live close to Lake Scugog, and the deepest part in Lake Scugog is about three or four meters deep. So compared to that, it's a deep lake. A lot deeper. Uh, another question here, did you see any turtles and which ones, if you did? 
The only turtles I've seen are painted turtles. There's, um, I mean, just trying to think if I had a snapper. There's certainly going to be snappers there and blandings as well, but the only ones I saw were painted turtles. Now I haven't spent, I've been on the reserve about four times and uh, two of the times I didn't even get into the marsh, uh, into the marsh. So, so um, yeah, that's, that's painted is all I've had. But also I guess what I could, should say is Lost Bay to the north is known to, to support a really large population of stink pot or musk turtles. And so the, there, there will certainly be in the marsh here, certainly, but musk turtles, they don't come out to sun. And so even where they're abundant, you wouldn't know it unless you see the odd nose sticking up, but they don't come out to sun like other turtles. So they're a lot harder to detect, but they would certainly be in the marsh as well. Interesting. Um, okay, and then just to add to that, I did see a, uh, a map turtle in the middle of the lake. So not on the, in the reserve itself, but um, about a kilometer to the west on, the, on an island in the middle of Gananoque Lake. Okay, so it's an it, it's an expected species there then, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have one comment, in fact, from Dan, who I believe is a fellow board uh, uh, a director with you on the Ontario Nature Board. Uh, Dan is commenting that regard with regards to canoeing to the reserve that his brother has paddled down Wiltsey Creek from the outlet in previous years. You park at the Cataraqui uh, Conservation Parking Lot at Charleston Lake Outlet and paddle down. Oh. Yeah, okay, okay, because actually there, there is also a bridge that um, crosses Wiltsey Creek, which would be a lot closer than starting at Charleston Lake. So it would be only maybe one or two kilometers to the, to the east. So there's, there is a road, there's a, a bridge. In fact, there's two bridges because there's another tributary that goes into the Wellsey Creek. So that would actually probably be the easiest, the shortest place to put a canoe or a kayak in because the river, the Wellsey Creek is quite a wide creek. So even at that bridge, it's certainly wide enough to paddle. Interesting. I have one, another comment from your, uh, from the Ontario Nature Executive Director, Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Caroline is just uh, commenting that others have seen gray rat snake, which you did mention, uh, map turtle, snapping turtle on the reserve. Another interesting point she's mentioning is that there is American eel found in Gananoque Lake, which is. Uh, okay, okay. Well, that's yeah, that's good to know. Well, certainly the river is is the Gananoque River is well connected to the St. Lawrence, so yeah, it would uh, would be. Um, I know the eels have a particular problem with dams on the. St. Lawrence River, and that's been the big concern for them. But I guess some of them are still able to get around the dam to get up into, into Gananoque Lake. So that's good to know. Uh, a couple of other questions here. Um, I have one is, I'm not sure if you can answer this, but uh, is there a timeline for putting in the trails and are volunteers required? That would have to be a question for Ontario Nature. Yeah, well, that was, um, let me see, that was Heather who's asking that. I'll see if I can find that out for you, Heather. And when we send a follow-up uh, to this uh, webinar, by the way, everyone will get a uh, get the link to the recording of this webinar, which you can view yourself again, or you can also send to your friends. So we'll try, when we send that out, we'll try and get some of these technical questions answered um, for you here. Um, I have one question here from Suda who's asking, are there any inhabitants on the lake, I believe she means on the lake. Um, I know there's those two cottages. I think this is what she's asking. Uh, there's those two cottages. Are those permanent? Could you remind me if you mentioned that or, or not? Oh, about uh, the cottages? Are they? Well, they're seasonal cottages. Seasonal cottages. That's yeah. what she means. And and actually, there there isn't a lot of of um, the nature reserve right along the lake shore. If you look closely at the boundaries, well, you see there's a big bulge. But the, the two cottages are quite far apart, and there's kind of a big bulge immediately west of the reserve because the road it kind of it comes to the very south end but then it snakes back up to the second cottage but then to the north of that that second cottage there is a strip where there is i don't know maybe a couple hundred meters of shoreline that's part of the reserve but um you see that a lot of it is, is is inland from the reserve there isn't a lot of actual lake shore 
Um, I have, in fact, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Caroline, uh, Caroline Schultz is chiming back in to answer Heather's question. Okay. Uh, trails and other access will be determined as we develop the management plan over the coming months. So um, just monitor and uh, I guess watch for news, wait for news on that. Um, and another question, which I think you might have answered at least in part, but is the reserve open for visitors by members? I don't know, technically, um, right now, how does that work? Or is that going to be one of those things that will be determined to make? Yeah, I, I think that would be a question for Caroline. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Here's a, a, a management question. I'm not sure if you can answer this as well, uh, James, but uh, uh, Norman is asking, how are Phragmites best removed and does the removal significantly disturb the marsh or would it disturb the marsh if it were removed? Well, yeah, I, I know that there are some, like, for example, in Toronto, for uh, what's the name of it, um, you for Steve Smith, who has a company called Urban Forest, he's had quite good success controlling Phragmites, where but it does take herbicide like it's it's virtually impossible to deal with it without herbicide and i've seen some some uh, projects like in michigan where they've been able to get phragmites out of some significantly large areas so it, it would be possible but it would take you would want to get someone like uh, urban forests in there on a contract and they'd have to deal with it several times and it would take some herbicide application which I know it's, it's difficult when we're in water, and so it is a fairly wet spot where it is. But it really would be a good idea to, if, if it's at all possible, to hit that Phragmites before it really becomes firmly established. All right, a uh, couple of uh, wildlife questions. Did you see any birds of prey? Yes, one of the birds we saw there was a red shouldered hawk, and that's a, a forest, like a forest interior bird that's is is uh, a provincially rare species and so in the front neck axis is known to be a, a good hot spot for them so we did see those i've seen red-tailed hawk fly over there's osprey on the lake and turkey vultures there's um and broadwing hawk all right uh, now besides the eel do we know anything about the fish in the lake and river not not a lot i mean i i didn't look at fish i'd never put out any minnow traps or anything like that that certainly would be something to look at i i i'm pretty sure it's a pretty diverse fish fish fauna in there i know to the thousand islands generally there's quite a high diversity of fish species again we get some of the southern species that we don't see elsewhere in ontario but i haven't i can't say specifically what's what's in the in the area or in and, all right. Okay. And were there beavers, signs of beavers? Active lodges or yes, there there were um there was evidence of beaver in that interior wetland in the north. There was some I didn't see the I know there was chewing around there and there was chewing. I haven't seen any beavers exactly, but yeah, some evidence of chewing trees is all I've seen, like the that you chewed off trunks. So I have um, one other comment to share from Caroline Schultz oh. with regards to whether the reserve is open or not. Um, as we know, the tr there are trails really built, but she's saying at this point, they're indicating that the reserve is not open to visitors, but as she has already mentioned, that uh, the management plan will determine access and how that will look. So they will be hosting uh, expert-led visits for members of Ontario Nature when they're able to do so after COVID uh, has uh, expired, hopefully. Um, on that note, Peter is asking, how can other naturalists get involved in future biodiversity surveys? And I, I wonder if I can find out from Caroline uh, later so we can send out that information uh, to all the attendees as well, how they can get involved in biological surveys here or perhaps in other potential reserves in the future. Um, I don't know that you can answer that, James. Uh, yeah, I, I I would hope that I mean we hope we don't have another year like this one. Yep. That uh, whether we would still have I mean I think it certainly would be a good idea to have a bio blitz here again because uh, because I certainly didn't find everything that's there and the more eyes you get out there, especially when you if we get experts like I know for example 
Dave Beadle has been brought into some of the places. And, and in fact, in fact, I wonder if a, um, I know Ottawa, when I was out there, the Ottawa field, there were a few people from the Ottawa field naturalists doing bird surveys. And I've not, I think they had the intent of doing moths as well. I'm not sure whether they actually did. I haven't heard finally. All but right. the, I'm sure the moth fauna will be quite, quite interesting in there with the diversity of trees and shrubs. Yeah. Um, I have one question that I think I can answer is, okay. is, is the Gananoque River part of the Rideau Canal waterway? And the answer to that is uh, no, it is not. It is a parallel system. Uh, the Rideau Canal system is going up the Cataraqui River, which is coming into Kingston, that's west. So they're, the Gananoque River and the Cataraqui are sort of running, running like that uh, together, but they're different uh, watersheds that way. Um, a couple of other comments here, a lot of comments, a lot of interest. Oh, um, Otto, Otto Peter, who's uh, also, I think, on your board, has mentioned that Jan Gilbert has come up with a method to remove fragment. He's using, um, what are they doing? They're cutting it underwater, which stops it from coming up again. And she's been able to remove large areas on the Lake Huron shoreline. That's very interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. I guess it depends on how the Phragmites is growing, like because often it's not really in a place where you can flood it. And I would certainly have to look at this closely to see whether that was a possibility here. Yep. All right. And I have another comment uh, s s alluding to the question, I think, from Peter from Samara, who is um, the Nature Reserves Manager with Ontario Nature. She's saying that the, uh, oh yeah, it's Auto Field Naturalist Club. She's saying that the Auto Field Naturalist Club surveyed for birds and members of the uh, Canadian Herpetological Society were surveying for reptiles and amphibians. So looks like uh, there's lots of surveying on different levels there. So um, I think I have another question from Alan. Would it be wise to remove the seed heads from Phragmites to reduce the spread of this invasive in the in the meantime? Um, I'm not sure that, that it propagates that freely by seed. It's really once it's in there by root, it's really getting, it's sort of infested, but uh, I don't know how we feel about removing seed heads. Yeah, I know it, it's a, it's a big job and it, it, I mean, you have to do it every year to be effective. I, I think they are spreading by seed as well. Maybe you may be right that they're mostly spreading by bits of root that are transported, but I, I think they are being spread by seed as well. Now the, the spot where they are, it's right along the Wilsey Creek. So it's, it seems possible that a, a section of root had had flowed down the creek and maybe just got lodged in there and that's how it started. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it would be a, I mean, it'd be a fairly big job, but it, it it probably would help. But on the other hand, it's once it's established, it's spreading year by year. It just, it doesn't seem to pop up here and there and everywhere. It often starts from a single patch and it just keeps growing outward from there. So I think you probably are right that it's not, the main spread is not by by seeds, but some of the spread is by seeds. So, and it sure does produce a lot of seeds. So even if one in a million of those seeds get uh, gets established, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, great. So I'm looking for other questions here. And um... the beaver, the beaver comment made reminded me of one thing: is that when we canoed up Wilsey Creek, we had a pair of otters that that popped up. And that was exciting. Just in the middle of the day, we saw a splash and then an otter head popped up and then a second otter head popped up. Excellent. Hey there. Very good. So um, I don't see any other uh, questions per se here. There are some other comments and uh, thank you to those who are contributing uh, some thoughts. And oh, just Caroline is just saying that cut and drown would be the preferred method for Phragmites control, but uh, the roots have to be underwater. So, yeah, so she's also echoing what Ottawa's mentioned about uh, success on the fishing islands in Lake Huron using that same method for fragmentous control. So, yeah, I think I, I think it would be a really good idea to uh, get out there and really look at that at that um, patch and see if that's doable because that's it certainly would be um, would be a good idea and and something that should be done fairly soon. But by critically looking at it. Uh, and seeing if it's possible to get a crew out there and cut it low and make sure it stays <laughs> stays underwater. Excellent. 
Well, um, so thank you. I, that's all for the, the questions I'm seeing here. Uh, thank you so much, James, for this really enlightening um, and encouraging tour. Uh, you know, not being able to get there ourselves necessarily it was nice just to get that little taste um, of uh, the Gananoque Lake Nature Reserve. And just a reminder to everyone uh, that you will be getting a recording of this and that there are two more reserves or, or two more webinars uh, featuring uh, the Ontario Nature Reserves. There will be one coming up featuring the nature reserves. That's more than one nature reserve on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula. And I have the date somewhere here. Um, uh, we'll, we'll include that information in the email to you. And we will also have the, uh, the Stone Road Alvar property on uh, Peely Island, which we'll be featuring in a, another future webinar for Ontario Nature. So thanks very much again, James. And thank you all of you who've attended this uh, talk and uh, we hope to be in touch with you again. Thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.